I did my first interview about automated transportation uh, and mobility as a service, robo taxis, back in 2017. And we've been following the development of autom autonomous driving technology and the business model for quite a while now. And it seems like 2021 uh, is going to be the year that this really begins to get into the economy. And we're going to be talking to Yusefa Petrunich from the Canadian Urban Transit Research and Innovation Consortium about a study they just completed about using electric low speed automated shuttles mm -hmm. to, to solve the problem of the first mile, last mile in Canadian transit. So, Yusefa, welcome to the interview. Thanks for having me, Markham. Why don't we start with an overview of your study, please? Yeah, it's a massive study, like all the studies we do, and I'm thankful that it's out the door. Uh, but basically, it's a study of autonomous and connected low-speed shuttles. So most people think about autonomous vehicles as autonomous cars. These are little mini electric buses that are driverless. And we took a look at uh, over nine cities across Canada. How would these shuttles operate on what we call a first kilometer, last kilometer route? So that's a very small route where right now there's no bus and there's never going to be a bus because it's too expensive, but it's just far enough that people don't want to walk that distance. So they might get in their car and drive. Uh, they might get a taxi or an Uber, uh, or they might just avoid taking transit altogether because of that last kilometer problem. Uh, so that's what we looked at and we tried to figure out well, exactly how many you know trips could happen before these little shuttles ran out of power because they're electric and little batteries how many charging episodes are needed so the shuttle might be driverless but then you might need somebody to plug in the shuttle to charge it up and then ultimately how many people can you move if you really want this as a transit service that's really fast and nimble and dynamic you've got to move a lot of people so how many people can you move and like i said we took a look at just under a dozen cities across canada and it showed some really positive results that you could get quite a lot of trips into a very short period of time. You could combine it with on-demand because these shuttles are connected, so you can demand them on your phone. Uh, and you could move dozens into the hundreds and in really optimized scenarios, uh, potentially thousands of people on these little first kilometer, last kilometer routes. Again, you know, to conclude, the report really focused on getting people to transit hubs, right? Getting them over this gap and into a mass transit hub. Let me give you an example. When I lived in Calgary, I was about 15 minutes uh, away by driving from uh, a C train station. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to go, go downtown, didn't want to pay for parking, I would consider a C train uh, ride. The problem was I had to get in my car, I had to drive to the C train parking lot, then I had to go, you know, hopefully I could find a spot because I couldn't always do that. Sometimes I had to pay for parking and then I had Take, then take the C train downtown. So it was longer than driving and, and, and it was annoying. And so if I could take a shuttle uh, to make that 15 minute trip that came directly, parked in front of my house, took me down there, then I could take a shuttle to wherever I needed when I got to the end of my, you know, got down downtown Calgary and then reverse to get back home. That seems very convenient to me. Is that what we're talking about? That's exactly what we're talking about. And even though we talk about first kilometer, last kilometer, because we want people to know, like it can be as short as 800 meters and people won't walk it. They will take their car, right? So it can be that short, but sometimes it's up to, as you say, 10, 15 kilometers. It's not that far if you're in a car, but you can't walk it. You can't cycle it. Definitely in the winter, if you have kids, you're wearing high heels and a skirt, it's not possible. Uh, and the bus might come around once every 30 minutes. So it's not convenient, right? Uh, and in this day and age, you're probably likely to call an Uber or a Lyft. And that adds to congestion. It adds to the cost. It adds to pollution. It's not good for the future of humanity in our cities. So that is definitely what we're talking about. So what are some of the obstacles to the adoption of these shuttles? Uh, so some of the obstacles are in the traditional transit world. The first obstacle is the tendency to want to buy 40 foot buses or 60 foot buses, because that's what transit is used to. And frankly put, that's what manufacturers produce. So all of the producers of these new shuttles are all new manufacturers. They are unknown entities in the transit world. And the transit world doesn't easily buy new manufactured products from unknown entities. So there's a bit of a cultural challenge. Challenge number two, most transit agencies don't know how these things will function because there's been very few pilots. 
So Canada funded federally a couple millions of dollars worth of pilots uh, over the last two years, starting in 2018. All of those pilots, one was in Calgary, one was in Surrey, one was, one's now in Toronto. They're all very short term, like two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. It was a little bit of a show and tell, and that was cool, but it didn't lead to nearly enough evidence for how riders would react, what you could charge for the ride, how the shuttles would break down or survive. Didn't give enough data for transit agencies to be ready right now to go buy this stuff, even if they trusted these new manufacturers. And then the third problem is on the manufacturing side of the equation and the technology, uh, the lack of standards uh, and standardization. So if you go by a neat, an easy mile shuttle or a Navia shuttle or to get their shuttle, these are all really great shuttles, but they communicate with each other in different ways. They communicate to the infrastructure in different ways. And if you think about it, these autonomous and connected shuttles, they need to know where they are. So they have a whole bunch of sensing equipment that tells them where they are, but then they have to know where they are in, in respect to the traffic lights and the intersections and other cars. So they have to communicate with other vehicles. And those vehicle to vehicle communications technologies are not standardized. So if you buy one kind of product, it can't talk to another product, which means you don't have interoperability, you can't mix and match, and transit agencies don't like that. They want standardized products, so in the future they can buy from that manufacturer or that manufacturer. So those are three of the biggest problems. Uh, the fourth last problem is for these vehicles to communicate with the infrastructure, with traffic lights, somebody has to install a roadside unit, a communication device that receives the signal from the vehicle and responds back. Well, it's not the job of the vehicle manufacturers to equip our cities with connected devices. And transit, it's not their job to equip our intersections and our traffic lights with that infrastructure. It is the job of cities and provinces. And cities and provinces are about a decade behind in thinking about smart cities infrastructure, like DSRC units, these dedicated short range communication units that let vehicles talk to each other. So we've got that whole compendium of problems. Now, my take on this, Yusupa, and, and I've interviewed EV analysts from the US where this is a little more advanced. I mean, uh, one analyst was telling me about how you could get off the uh, the plane at McCarran Airport in, in Las Vegas and take a shuttle down uh, downtown like this. And, and it's just kind of standard operating procedure now. Nobody even bats an eye at it. So are the benefits of these kinds of shuttles solving the last first mile, last mile problem are the benefits enough that we'll be able to overcome, overcome the obstacles that you just talked about? Yeah, I do think so, because the technology, first of all, doesn't have to wait that much longer. Like when people say, well, the technology is not ready enough for autonomous vehicles to navigate all traffic conditions. That's fine. We don't need them to navigate all traffic conditions. We need them to navigate some dedicated laneways that they are being put on and a select number of left-hand turns and right-hand turns. If you know where these shuttles are being applied right now for, tra for transit purposes, they're not gonna go anywhere under any condition. They're gonna go into a certain geofenced area that we can design the street to accommodate the shuttle. So number one, if our urban design catches up and can be made to catch up pretty quickly, look how quickly we installed bicycle lanes during the pandemic. All of a sudden, 10 years of debate about whether we should have bicycle lanes disappeared and we had bicycle lanes crop up all over the place. So what we're talking about are basically larger bicycle lanes for these shuttles. And you can get these shuttles going pretty much tomorrow in a very safe and secure fashion. And secondly, I would just say the culture has to catch up. Um, so the benefits of mass mobility, transit ridership, always outweigh the challenges up front of getting the technology to work. Because there's no better way to save cities money than to get people out of their car, stop damaging the environment, stop damaging the roads, stop killing us all with congestion and get the economy going, get people into mass mobility, the dollars pay themselves off. Yosefa, thank you very much for this, really appreciate it. Thank you, Michael.